Hello, my name is John Bowers and I'm director of the Institute for Energy Efficiency at UC Santa Barbara. I wanna talk about photonic integrated circuits and, and the future of where we're going with silicon in particular. So this slide shows our version of, of a photonic Moore's law that shows the increase in level of complexity of three technologies. Blue tr diamonds are indium phosphide based technologies. The red circles which have rapidly eclipsed that are monolithic silicon photonics without lasers integrated. And the green triangles are the most recent work with laser integration on, on this platform. If you look at silicon photonics, you know, it started with Storif and Bennett uh, 20 years ago, and uh, it started very slowly, but now it's ex extremely fast. Over 5,000 papers a year being written uh, on silicon photonics. And that's because of this increased functionality, initially just grading couplers and modulators then laser integration, SOAs, uh, PICs, and most recently, uh, commercialization at 100 gigabit by a number of companies. And the most recent one is uh, co-packaging, which we heard about in the previous talk. So the trend is to integrate lots of things together in silicon. Uh, lasers with low loss waveguides, modulators, detectors, MEMS, and nonlinear materials that I wanna talk about in particular. So, Silicon is very good at some things. The waveguides are very low loss and they're very strongly confining, but very poor for light emission. And so integrating gain from either gallium arsenide or phosphide is important, or lithium alveate uh, for nonlinear devices, or YIG for, for isolators. Key part of this is having the laser integrated. And uh, we've proceed, pursued several approaches to this. One is heterogeneous integration, where three, five materials are bonded on the silicon, and you can make a very high quality laser. In fact, as I'll show you, you can make a better laser on silicon than you can uh, on native substrate. The other approach, and, and this, this wafer here shows one of Intel's 300 millimeter uh, wafers of uh, 100 gigabit uh, transceiver chips. At the top here is, is work we've been doing in collaboration with IQE at growing quantum dots on silicon. And again, in this case, we're growing 300 millimeter wafers and we don't yet have lasers on that size, but we have lasers on smaller sizes using the stransky krasnov way to get quantum dots. And the quality is getting actually quite good and the reliability is getting quite good. And this paper by Alan Lou summarized where that's at. So in terms of commercialization of this laser integration, Intel has led that. And uh, here's two products that they've commercialized and are shipping at, at more than 2 million units per year. Uh, one is a, integrating four lasers with four modulators and, and uh, four detectors. And the other one is now uh, using CWDM, so combining different laser wavelengths together and uh, then a single fiber. And uh, so that's the beginning where we are today listed on the left of having pluggables on the edge of circuit boards with uh, say big switches in the center of them connect with a lot of electronics, which takes a lot of equalization and excess power. If you move the optics on board, the yellow squares in the center, that reduces the power dramatically. But where the world is really headed is what's on the right side, co-packaging, as we heard in the previous talk. And as Intel shows here, the 100 gigabit pluggable is about the same size as something which has 16 times the capacity, this 1.6 terabit engine that they demonstrated at OFC or earlier this year. At UCSB, we've gotten up to about 2.5 terabits per second. And again, this illustrates the need for laser integration, because in this case, there's basically 64 DFB lasers on this chip, and also the need for EPDA. And so, you know, wrapping waveguides from all these lasers to all these modulators to all these AWGs and, and all the wiring for them is, is very complex and very easy to make a mistake. And so, in this case, we've integrated about 440 devices together and, uh, it really needs uh, EPDA like, like OptoCompiler. Here's another example. Um, this is, again, a sensor application, but it's an integrated optical device driver for, for optical gyroscopes. And so in this case, you need lasers with modulators and detectors, and, uh, and then typically waveguides. And these waveguides are typically meters long. And so you need, again, automated layout of all these devices as well as, as the waveguide itself. So there's some pictures here of how these individual components work 
and lower right, you can see how it works as a sensor. And this is actually a very exciting application. Um, here's an example of the layout of one of those reticules. And again, this was done with OptoDesign, the predecessor to what we're talking about today, what's being introduced. Um, but it was really essential to have, a, again, an automated layout program to, to lay out these more complex devices in reasonable amounts of time. So now I want to delve a little bit more into the waveguide technologies, which are essential for gyroscopes. Um, but also it allows us to make better lasers, as you'll see, than you can make on native substrates. And this is because the losses on silicon are much lower than on indium phosphide. And so rather than 35 dB per meter, 0.35 dB per centimeter, um, we can get losses that are a tenth that much on with silicon waveguides and a thousandth as much with silicon nitride waveguides. And that makes for much higher Q resonators and much lower loss, uh, lower uh, phase noise and line with lasers. So again, this is sort of what we, we all think about that, that uh, to have really narrow line with lasers, we need fibers or gases or things that are, are bulky and expensive. In some detectors, we think of having lines of on the order of a megahertz. But what I'll show in the next couple of slides is we can get this down to just say 100 hertz heterogeneously integrated lasers, and if we lock those to resonators, we can get that down to just three hertz, and I'll show that result. And that's really exciting. And this shows that trend. So the right-hand side, you can see over time, reduction of loss from 6 dB down to 0.1 dB, and then the structures that we've evolved to in the center. On the lower left, left-hand column, you can see the, the line lists. And so we're now down to, say, just 120 hertz. And frankly, I think we'll be down in these sorts of structures to just 10 hertz fairly soon. This illustrates that trend over time, and uh, you see that the indium phosphide native substrate laser technology is kind of saturated around line widths of about 100 kilohertz. Um, but a whole bunch of groups around the world using silicon technology, silicon oxide, silicon nitrate technologies are getting line widths below a kilohertz. The two lowest lines are, are ours, and that paper listed there, the tutorial, by Min Tron goes through all the physics. And there's really interesting physics that you have to conquer to, to get these low line widths. But there's a lot of interesting positive optical feedback that you can get or negative optical feedback um, that, that make these line widths work, work so well. This is, again, uh, another example of where one really needs e EPDA. And this project is to build an optical frequency synthesizer. And actually, it works extremely well. And on the left-hand side, you can see the goal is to generate a comb of frequencies. And if you generate an octave of frequencies, then you can double the low frequency side and mix it with the high frequency side and determine quite accurately what the optical frequency is. And at the end of this, you'll see we can, we can generate a wavelength accurate to less than one hertz and with a line width on the order of one hertz. So the upper right, you can see the comb that's generated inside silicon nitride. It's an octave in bandwidth. In the lower right, you can see a smaller comb. These comb lines are separated by 15 gigahertz. And that's because we need to lock our laser to one of those lines. We wanted to do so with fairly low frequency electronics that uh, could be used. And so the upper lines are spaced every terahertz. The lower lines are spaced every 15 gigahertz. That gets in the electronic area. But as shown in the center, we can lock one of these tunable lasers I showed in the previous slide. And uh, uh, know, pick a particular line to work on and know exactly what frequency we have. And so this shows that whole configuration. Um, the upper left is, is the tunable laser, and then the upper, in the middle are the two resonators, the 15 gigahertz and the one terahertz resonators. And then um, on the right-hand side is the tunable laser we're locking to those lines. The lower left, you can see the frequency of the output of the laser as we, as we step it. In this case, we're stepping it by less than a hertz. 0.745 hertz. And so we're demonstrating here the frequency control of basically uh, one part in two to the 15. And uh, that's really amazing. The lower right side shows the package we're putting together, um, including all the electronics to do the, to make a very compact optical synthesizer. The last example I want to show I'm really excited about, and this builds on that Dodos work, and it was just recently published in Nature about a month ago. In this case, we take a fairly noisy laser, uh, indium phosphide DFB laser with about roughly a megahertz line width, and we injection lock it to one of these high Q resonators and uh, silicon nitride resonators. And if you look at the 
upper right, you can see the reduction in noise. And you can see that it's going down by, you know, 20 dB at low frequencies and 30 or 40 dB at higher frequencies. And we can get much less noise on each of those phase lines. And uh, in the center, you can see that what's happening is we're, when we pump these resonators and we injection lock, we're getting soliton generation out of these structures. And, uh, and it's really quite quiet. And the most recent results, um, we're seeing line was down to just three hertz. And so this injection lock system is very complex on how it operates, but it's really promising for making very compact, as you can see in this case, package devices uh, for, for a variety of, of applications from datacom to, uh, to sensors. The last type I want to talk about is going from those silicon nitride or silicon oxide resonators that were used in those experiments to gallium arsenide. And the reason we want to do this is gallium arsenide is about a thousand times more nonlinear than silicon oxide. And consequently, when you generate these soliton combs, it takes just a fraction of the power uh, rather than watts of power, just microwatts of power. And so this is the technology. So again, it's, it's aluminum gallium arsenide that we bond onto silicon. Uh, and so we can integrate it again with lasers and uh, getting cues, as you can see in the upper left, of about 2 million. And in the center, you can see we're generating combs with just 36 microwatts of power. So this really works. It's very integral. Um, and uh, in the lower right, you see a bunch of papers of the last Clio on using these gallium arsenide devices for efficient comb generation, for uh, SPS generation, for signal processing. And so it's really quite an exciting area. So to summarize, you know, complicated high performance picks are being commercialized today by a number of companies, Cisco, Acacia, Juniper Networks. They're in high volume. Uh, I mean, Intel is doing more than 3 million in, in, in 2020. And uh, so lasers and silicon are here today. Um, Epitaxial lasers are progressing quickly. And the highest level of integration today is about, with lasers integrated, is about 1,500 elements. Um, and with this integration, we can actually make better lasers than you can without integration. So integrating lasers with resonators can get you, as I've shown here, 120 hertz Lorentzian line width. And another work we've recently submitted down to three hertz. Um, and finally, gallium arsenide resonator technology, again, it's really interesting for a whole bunch of applications from second harmonic generation to soliton generation. And actually quantum computing becomes very exciting. So the point is that PICs are now so complex that I think EPDA is essential. So I'm really, excited to be part of this um, product demonstration today and uh, it's going to be i think very valuable for all of us so i want to thank all the students and postdocs in my group uh, and darp and rpe for funding this thank you <laughs>